sports fans, and thanks for tuning into the Press Box. My name is Jeff Richardson, and I'll be your host tonight. I'm going to be joined for the next 30 minutes by our analysts, Ty Reynolds and Jeff Tobin. Good, good to have you guys here tonight. Uh, before we get into the show, I'd like to remind our audience out there that if you have a question or comment, please feel free to call us at 873-6713. And uh, without wasting any more time, guys, the big topic around town is obviously the World Series. Uh, let's dive right into it. The Braves dug themselves a holes, uh, dug themselves a hole. Ty, is there any way we can win this thing? Well, sure, there's a way you can win it. Uh, first of all, last week we broke this uh, series down into five categories with uh, hitting, uh, starting pitching, the bullpen, speed, and defense. And so far, what we thought would happen has basically happened with a few surprises. I, I forgot to throw in a category here, and that's intangibles. The Braves have done a few things fundamentally wrong, and I think that's why they've dug themselves a hole. On the other hand, the Braves have given us the pleasant surprises that we expected, such as with the good starting pitching, and their starting pitching has been a little over three, and uh, that's pretty good against a strong hitting Toronto ball club that hit uh, over 160 home runs during the regular season. Well, uh, okay, Ty, you're right about that. I mean, the thing is, there's been a lot of second guessing this week, and you know, during the series about Bobby Cox's um, not being able, you know, putting Jeff Reardon in late in the game and Reardon not coming through, and you know, that being one of your categories as far as bullpen. Uh, I think the main factor is Braves hitters have not hit until last night. Last night they came out of it in a big way. I mean, if you look at the stats before last night's game, only Deion Sanders and Sid Bream were hitting over 200. Uh, Brian Hunter was one for four, if you want to throw him in. But, I mean, as far as starters, I mean, Deion only played, you know, has only played a couple games, and he's not been that, you know, Deion has really come up and, and done a big thing for us. Uh, he played well last night. He got a hit, knocked in Otis to give us the uh, lead before the slam by Lonnie Smith. Um, you can say all you want about Bobby Cox uh, using his pitching and, and bullpen and everything, but the bottom line is we've got to be able to go out there and score runs, and they did that last night, the big slam with Lonnie, and, you know, now we've got, you know, we're, we're coming back to Atlanta and, and face it. I mean, you talk to most people, and not too many people were thinking that we we're going to win game five. Well, that's true, but now let's take a look at this. Uh, Jack Morris, we've seen him now, and we've knocked him up pretty good in the series. <clears throat> he, he's got a pretty high ERA for the series now. Okay, the Braves can do this now. They've got a chance. David Cohn, and his one appearance against the Braves, got knocked around pretty good. His ERA is around six and a half. So, again, you have a good chance. Uh, some of the other Toronto pitchers, uh, Guzman and Key have really had the Braves' number and have uh, really handcuffed them. Uh, the Braves do need to come out and score runs, I'll admit that. They have come into uh, some good pitching, but <clears throat> here's their chance to really come out and uh, face someone that they've seen quite a bit uh, in the past couple of years. Well, I think that's a big key is the fact that they have faced David Cohn in the National League all year. He's been with the Mets and before he got traded. Uh, I'd like to take a time out. Let's go to the phones and see if we can get this <coughs> caller on. Caller, you're on the air. Yes, my question is, and one of the gentlemen just commented on it, is the fact that the other night when they had a guy on third and second, uh, the decision was made not to put in a pinch hitter, uh, which you just mentioned that Deion Sanders and Sid Bream, who were available, were not used, and yet he had, uh, elected to use uh, Jeff Blauser. Uh, to me, there have been a lot of, to me, major mistakes in terms of coaching, and I'd like to get their comments on that. I think he's referring to the instance when Tim McCarver uh, talked about the fact that he would pinch hit for Blauser. Uh, right. Uh, uh, that, is, that has been a significant point here, and that's a good question. Uh, Jeff Blauser had, was really uh, one of the key ingredients offensively for the Braves, given the Braves' production in uh, that shortstop position late in the year, and uh, basically won a starting spot. And Bobby Cox manages with a lot of hunches. A lot of times he goes with percentages. Sometimes he goes with hunches. Uh, you, you had a scenario where if you, bring, uh, if, you, if you bring in a pinch hitter, Toronto had a left-hander ready, and I believe that was David Wells. I think you're right. Now, you could have been in a situation where they would have brought Wells out, and then he would have been able to face a left-hander, but then do you sit there and pinch hit for that left-hander, or do you leave him in there? Well, you've got Jeff Blauser, who's a true fastball hitter in that situation. He hit the heck out of the ball. He hit it right at John Olrood. I mean, Olrood made a good play and got him out. I mean, that ball's a foot either way. It's either a single or a double, and you got two runs in. Uh, Jeff Blauser down the stretch, as you've mentioned, was, I mean, phenomenal after the All-Star break. And face it, I mean, you're talking about potential tie situation. Do you want Rafael Belliard in there hitting in the 10th and 11th innings if you have a tie game? I mean, he's not going to help you offensively. And um, 
Sure. I mean, you can sit there and say uh, Deion Sanders and, and Sid Bream can come up there and, and get a hit, and Bream have both of them. You're talking about the two guys with the highest averages on the team in the World Series. Yet at the same time, you're also saying, well, if you put Deion Sanders in there, how much batting practice has Deion had? I mean, you've got a lot of things to factor in, and you can only say so much as a manager. And Bobby Cox came out and said, I will never pinch hit for Jeff Blauser. And Jeff Blauser is one of our frontline players, and he's one player I would not pinch hit for. So that was Bobby's uh, rendering of it, and you can see that going. All right, I think we've got another call. Uh, caller, you're on the air. Hello, caller. Okay, maybe we don't. Uh, let's move on a little bit. Let's, let's talk about Bobby Cox's managing on that same subject. Uh, did he go to the well too much with Jeff Ridden there? Well, my feelings are pretty strong about this. I never wanted to see Jeff Ridden, period. Well, who I wanted to see was Peter Smith. Smith has been one of the best pitchers down the stretch for the Braves. He's 7-0, and had a 2.05 ERA, and Toronto's never seen him. You got Jeff Reardon, who got cracked with over a 4.0 ERA over in the American League. And that's really hard for a reliever to have an over a four ERA, considering that a lot of times the runs that he allows to score belong to starting pitchers. He had over a four ERA. I mean, that's, that's just really uh, an indication to me that he really didn't fool too many American League hitters, and Toronto's one of the best hitting ball clubs over there. Well, you've got Jeff Reardon, who's your, you know, the guy who's the all-time leader in saves. I mean, if you're, if you're a coach, you have to, a manager, you have to sit there and say, this is going to be my closer. Now, obviously, in my opinion, I agree with you to a certain extent. I, I think that Jeff Reardon should have been put in a situation where he couldn't hurt the Braves, in a, in a situation where a middle relief to late you know, setup man type of situation. That way he could have possibly seen if, you know, if, he could, if Toronto were hitting him or not and use Mike Stanton and, um, and uh, Wohlers as, as closing. And Stanton is, you know, did a phenomenal job last night. So, you know, you have that situation. As far as... You know, I, I always you, you go back to the axiom when a team wins, the, the coach. I mean, did anything get said today? I mean, as far as conversations about Bobby Cox, no, because the Braves won. But when they lose, it's like, well, he should have done this, he should have done that. I mean, I, you know, Jerry Glanville, Lord knows, the same situation. I mean, whenever the Falcons lose a game, it's Jerry Glanville's fault. It's not, you know, I mean, all the coach can do, all the manager can do is stick players in the field and expect them to perform, expect them to earn their paychecks. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. And one thing we felt that would happen last week is that we thought Lonnie Smith would be the Braves designated hitter the whole time up there, and uh, that's what it turned out to be. And well, that turned out to be a pretty good decision. Well, yeah, there you got Lonnie Smith hitting in the 160s. Yeah. You got Ron Gant uh, basically sitting down, and not playing. Who he's obviously not real happy about that. But at the same time, you know, instead of having Ron Gant up in that situation, you have Lonnie Smith who comes up and hits a grand slam home run. So. I think it's interesting to point out that we're really only two clutch hits away from being the world champs tonight. Well, that's true, but uh, uh, Toronto may be in a situation where they could say the same thing. Well, I think uh, they've, they've gotten their hits. That's why they're <laughs> in the position they're in. Yeah. We, we didn't get ours, and they got theirs. Well, that's true, and, and a lot of that comes down to the bullpen, and we felt that Toronto really had the big advantage in the bullpen with uh, Ward and the Terminator. Uh, you've seen the difference. They have ERAs of zero. Reardon's 13 and a half for the series. I think the numbers speak for themselves. All right, before we move on and change the subject, what about Deion Sanders and Tim McCarver? Uh, there was some speculation that Deion may not be put on the World Series roster. Do you guys agree or disagree with the fact that he's here? Obviously, we've, we've got some hindsight now, and he's, he's batting 500. So. Well, the funny thing about Deion is, I mean, you're talking about an athlete in a typical situation. I mean, he's being hammered by the press. He's being hammered by you know, a lot of different people saying, he doesn't need to be playing two sports. He needs to focus in on one or the other. Um, Dion is a multi-talented athlete. I mean, I don't think there's any um, question about it. The guy can play two professional sports. I think that's an incredible feat. Um, you know, to be honest with you, the way uh, reporters are and the way the press is, it's amazing. You know, they can't do anything back to him, okay? Sure, you know, Dion's getting paid to go out there and play football and play baseball. The, um, the press is getting paid to cover the games, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, at the same time, I mean, taking cheap, uh, cheap shots and stuff like that against him, you know. I mean, McCarver was really, and McDonough, both of them, were really critical about McCarver doing both, um, uh, critical about uh, Dion doing both. And so at the same time, I mean, but, you know, Dion, yeah, he got out of hand maybe a little bit. But at the same time, it's not like he beat the guy up. I mean, he That's just threw true. water on him. And you're in a locker room in a celebration. I mean, you're going to get wet. You know, it's just, I don't know. I, I think the whole thing was um, way overblown. Blown out of proportion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I really don't uh, agree with what Dion did, but I, I do agree that it was blown out of proportion. Uh, there's no doubt about it that Dion should be on the uh, World Series roster. 
And uh, one reason and one reason only that immediately comes to my mind is speed. The Braves have 12 out of 14 uh, in the stolen base category. Uh, Deion Sanders has three of those. And Pat Borders has really been unsuccessful throwing these people out. And it's really put a lot of emphasis and, and possibly have bothered some of these starting pitchers. Yeah, at the same time, as well as Pat Borders having trouble throwing out stolen base, he has no problem once he walks up to the plate. The guy has absolutely destroyed Atlanta pitching. I mean, you're talking about a guy who's hit 240 for the season. He walks up and just kills it. Kelly Gruber's hitting 228. He hits a you know, game-tying home run. He scores a decisive run in, in game four. I mean, you're talking about these guys. I mean, um, Carter and Winfield and Alomar and, and Devon White are not hurting us offensively. But when you talk about, you know, it's key hits, you're getting guys from the bottom line, kind of like Mark Lemke did a year ago. This may go down to as, as the series of the catcher in history. It seems like the catchers have come up with some big hits in the series. Well, Damon Berryhill won. You know, Scott he's got two hits in the series, and one of them was one game one for and us. And Sprague hit that uh, pinch hit home run, and Borders is batting 438. I never thought I'd see him do that. <laughs> <laughs> you can do anything in the World Series. You've got that adrenaline pumping. All right, before we change the subject to the Atlanta Knights, I'd like to remind you guys to give us a call at 873-6713 uh, if you have a question. Uh, I want to go ahead and thank our sponsors while I got a chance. Uh, they are the Atlanta Knights Hockey Club, Sporting Times Newspaper, Sports Life Fitness Centers, and Atlanta Voice Newspaper. Uh, let's move on to the Atlanta Knights Hockey Club, guys. The hockey's back in Atlanta. Uh, the Knights are 4-0. They're in first place in their division. Uh, they even drew 10,000 fans the other night. I think that's really significant and something that people are really going to look at as attendance for these games in Atlanta. And there's no doubt in my mind that the city is wanting an NHL team back here, and it's just a question of going out and proving it and putting people in the stands. All right, I think we have a phone call. Let's go to the phones right quick. Caller, you're on the air. Yes, I do have a question. Okay, uh, go ahead. I was really interested in finding out whether uh, you guys feel that uh, maybe uh, Atlanta may someday have another NHL team. And I have another question for Jeff after you answer that. Okay, anybody want to take a shot at the uh, NHL question? Well, I mean, if you're talking about a national, um, if, if the NHL is going to go in a national um, situation like the <clears throat> NBA and the NFL and uh, Major League Baseball, they're going to have to have a market in Atlanta. They're going to have to have a team here. I mean, Atlanta is one of the biggest uh, cities in America. You know, I mean, obviously hockey interest in the South isn't huge, but the only way you do that is you get, an exp you know, you get a minor league team down here. If we can have some success with that and draw some folks. I mean, the Flames drew not real great, but at the same time they had a winning team. I mean, they were one of the best teams, if you want to look at record-wise, in Atlanta sports history. And... Um, at the same, you know, I mean, being a, a friend, uh, minor league team to Tampa Bay, I mean, if Tampa Bay takes off, that's another key. Tampa Bay being another southern team, if we could get some kind of southern uh, hookup here, I think we'd be in good shape. Uh, I'd like to hit on that also. Uh, the uh, franchise fee for the, for the recent clubs to get in was something like $50 million. One thing you're going to have to do is find someone with uh, an exorbitant amount of cash uh, to, uh, to help put a club here. I mean, you're just going to need money, and, and I don't know if there's anyone around here that – is willing to do that or take that chance. All right, I think uh, we uh, call her still on the air. Do you have another question? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Jeff, uh, who do you think is going to win this weekend, the Chiefs or the competitor? <laughs> that might be a uh, Chief on the phone there, it sounds like. Yeah, but I, sure I don't is. think the competitors have a chance. The Chiefs will, will take it in a lot. Ah, I thought so. <laughs> okay, guys. All right, See thanks you later. for the call. Thank you. Uh, anyhow, back to the Knights. They drew 10,000 fans on a, on a night when we actually had uh, Georgia Tech and Florida State playing over at uh, Grant Field. Well, we had 46,000 people there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, Game 1 of the World Series drew about 50,000 to the stadium. Uh, how do you explain the success? I think people are, are hungry, and not only that, I have to hand it to the Knights. It was a pretty good marketing idea uh, to set up like <laughs> a sports bar atmosphere and uh, show some ball games at the arena there and then have their game at 5 o'clock. Yeah, and the whole thing was set up rather well. One more thing you have to consider is that there were over 80,000 in Athens that weekend. So, I mean, you're talking about a lot of people from the Atlanta area going over there. So, um, there, there's been a lust for hockey in this city since they left in 1980. Uh, since the Flames left, I mean, it's really been something. And just to have another team, I mean, people are really hungry for it. I mean, they've had some NHL exhibitions the last couple of years, and they've drawn 10,000 in that area. So, I mean, I think it's a real good sign that the Knights are – being able to draw that well, plus being undefeated. I mean, you know, you, hey, right. if, you're, if you're any kind of sports fan, you want to go see an undefeated team. All right, I think uh, this is probably a popular topic. Let's go to the phone calls again. Caller, you're on the air. How are you guys doing? 
Pretty good. How you doing tonight? All right. Uh, what do y'all think about the Philadelphia Eagles' chances this year to make the Super Bowl? Philadelphia. Uh, well, that's Jeff, you're an NFL fan. Ty, you want to go first? Then? I'll go first on that because uh, one thing that I really like about the Eagles and, and teams winning football games uh -huh. is with defense. And Philadelphia has got uh, a great defensive club. I, I can only just speculate how good they would be if they still had Jerome Brown. You think they're doing uh, there well is, without him? Uh, they had, although their defense was victimized in uh, a game against uh, the Chiefs over there in Kansas City, uh, Philadelphia is a good football team. They're going to contend. It wouldn't surprise me one bit if they were a wild card team and went on and really went far in the playoffs. Well, I, you've got the Eagles, and they've lost two in a row, but they've lost to the Chiefs, and, and uh, they also lost to the Redskins. If you look at that Redskins game more closely, you see that the Redskins drove down the field but couldn't put the ball in the end zone. I mean, they kept the, they kept, uh, the Eagles in the game all game. I mean, you're talking about high-powered offense. I mean, the world champs at, in their own ball yard, and still they have, you know, won by four points or so. So, I mean, you're talking about the Eagles. Plus, I think the key to the Eagles this year it's Herschel Walker. Without a doubt, ball control. Plus Randall Cunningham yeah. is something else. I mean, Randall Cunningham wasn't there last year. They went 10-6. and six. I mean, he got hurt in the first game. And Randall's come back and had a good year so far. And being able to be able to uh, run and pass is a big key to the Eagles. And it's a good, big key to any offense. And you have to remember Herschel Walker's in the backfield. He's had a couple hundred-yard games this year already. He's in the top five in rushing in the NFC. So, I mean, you're talking about a, a very explosive offense. <laughs> Cunningham can make so many things happen. It, he can win a few games for you. Is this a Super Bowl team to answer the caller's question? I think right now I think that uh, the Eagles are probably one of the one or, you know, if you look at the NFC, one, or, um, one of the one or two teams to win uh, definitely have a chance to win. All right. All right. Thank, thanks for the call. Uh, before we change, before we're on the subject of the NFL, let's stay here. But I'd like to encourage you guys, uh, the Knights have home games next Tuesday and Thursday night against San Diego. Uh, exciting hockey's back in Atlanta. Get out there and see them. Hey, that San Diego team's 5-0. 6-0. 6-0. They're 6-0. Pretty tough. Uh, back to the NFL. Let's talk about the Falcons. They got uh, skunked pretty bad Sunday. Well, let's talk about the Falcons. And my favorite topic with the Falcons is their defense or, or lack thereof. <laughs> let's just go over a few things. Yards allowed per game, around uh, 392, a little over that. That's uh, last. <laughs> uh, most first downs allowed, uh, or rather touchdowns allowed, 21. That's last. Uh, most touchdowns allowed on the ground, 10. That's last. Fewest interceptions, three. Tied for last with three other clubs, and they only have nine sacks, which is, uh, I guess, encouraging compared to the other stats where they're only fifth from the last. Uh, Jerry Glanville's got a lot of work to do. Kyle, you've been doing some reading this week, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, with the, with the Falcons, it's, it's the same old thing. <laughs> All right, I think we have another caller. Let's go to the phones. Uh, caller, you're on the air. Uh, yes, sir. How y'all doing tonight? Just fine. Uh, let me ask you a question, please, about the Falcons. Why does Glanville don't try to get no defense to help? Last year we had a good team. This year we got a good team, but no defense, no pad rush or nothing. Defensive uh, back need help bad. That, that's pad a good question. They seem to ignore the defense in the draft. Yeah. Well, well, let's see here. Yeah, well, Jeff, go ahead. ahead. Well, I think, you know, we've talked about this before. The thing with the Falcons, what they're trying to do is to get a good um, – Team speed defense. On, they play eight games in, um, in the Dome and the AstroTurf. Their defensive line isn't quite as big as, it, as other defensive lines. They're trying to get quickness instead of size. Um, and for that factor, you're going to have teams being able to run on you. You're going to have teams able – I mean, basically what you need in that type of format is a big play type of defense. Well, the Falcons haven't been able to do that. Uh, alluding to the game against San Francisco, all I can think of is um, San Francisco has a huge lead um, early third quarter. And you have Steve Young throwing a long pass to Jerry Rice. And let me tell you something. I mean, that, that's cold. I mean, all I can say is, you know, we beat the Niners twice last year. And in my opinion, it's like, you know, just give, you know, putting, um, it's like trying to rub it in our face. But one thing is, they have to come back to the Dome. And I don't know if that's such a good idea. I mean, Falcons aren't that much worse than the 49ers. I know 56-17 is like, God, they're horrible. I don't, I don't buy that. I mean, the Falcon, Falcons aren't that bad of a team. They're, two, they're probably the best 2-5 and five team in the NFL, I know. I know that's kind of like well, the best two and five team, but I mean, look at the, look at the talent on that team. I mean, they're, they're pretty, I mean, they're very good offensively. Chris Miller's in the top three or four, and then you get back to Chris Miller. You know, everybody's talking about Chris Miller, saying, well, he he's not a very good quarterback, but uh, uh, statistically, I mean, he's in the top two or three in completions and yardage and touchdowns. Um, 
I just think that this team is defensively, you know, the caller is very much correct. I mean, we're really hurting on the defense. Well, uh, one thing that I can go back to is blown draft choices. Uh, some of the first ones that come to my mind is Andre Bruce out of Auburn, uh, Marcus Cotton out of USC. Both of those were a couple of busts. And then I just cannot stand that Steve Broussard pick. I mean, here it is. If you wanted a good running back, there was one available here in the state in Rodney Hampton who's doing a great job in New York City. And still, uh, we had to sit there and spend another first-run draft pick uh, the most recent year on Tony Smith. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think Rodney Hampton would do that good in the run shoot? Well, I don't know, but no, at least Rodney he would Hampton stay healthy. Rodney Hampton does that good because he is in the New York Giant he's offense. He's in the eye. Which is, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a running offense, and that's the reason he's having great success. I'm not saying he's not a bad back because he's very good, one of the best young running backs in the NFC. But at the same time, I mean, Broussard, you know, you, you're talking about Jerry Glanville, and, and I don't want to alleviate saying he's not doing a good job, but at the same time, is he using his personnel correctly? And, you know, we, we talked about Sean Collins before and how he was the NFC, one of the NFC uh, players of the year, uh, made the all-rookie team, excuse me, and all of a sudden disappeared. And then you got Broussard, who I think has a very talented back to use him as a receiver out of the backfield. But if you're on the run and shoot, you have to have your running back blocking a lot of times because you don't have two backs in the backfield, so, and you don't have a tight end. So Well, I'd rather take my chances with Hampton and Broussard. <laughs> All right, caller, are you still on the air? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, okay. ma'am. Did you have something to add? Uh, yeah, I'm saying pretty good, and I appreciate it. All right, you. we appreciate All your right, call. Thanks keep, a lot. keep watching. Uh, guys, before we get to college football, I know there's a couple of Vikings fans on the stage here. Let's, let's talk about that Minnesota-Washington game. Well, I think it's a huge game. Uh, you're talking about a 5-1 and one Minnesota team, but their, their five wins are against the Bays. They're against the Bears, who, you know, very much celebrated feud between Dick uh, and Harbaugh, which, in my opinion, was blown way out of proportion. I mean, they had a, a big lead. He made a bad play. It was a touchdown. It happens every week in the NFL. It happens every week in any game. I mean, you know, it's a bad decision by Harbaugh, but you can't blame Jim Harbaugh. He's a quarterback. He's on the field. He sees what he sees. Um, plus, you know, they beat the Cincinnati Bengals, another young team. I mean, the Vikings have not beaten a winning team yet. And you're talking about they're taking on the Super Bowl champs. So this is a make-or-break game, in my opinion, for the Vikings. On the other hand, I think Minnesota beat Washington 30 to nothing in the preseason, in the pre which, uh, granted, in that may not mean too much. In the preseason. Okay, you're right. Um, they did. But, again, this is the test. If the Vikings come out their home. I mean, they've got everything going for them. Dennis Green's done a great job with that team. I think he's basically taken a very talented team and taught them, said, hey, guys, we can win. Um, go out there. You're very talented, da-da-da-da. Jerry Burns couldn't do that. Jerry Burns, I mean, theory, I mean, the Vikings had all kind of unrest uh, with the, within the players. But now you've got a, uh, a coach who believes in his team, and he's got them believing in themselves. Rich Gannon's kind of banged up right now, although uh, Salisbury, the backup, isn't too bad. So I think they have an excellent chance of beating the Redskins. And if they do, it, you can see Minnesota go up a step. If they lose that game, though, it's going to be a big uh, factor because the Vikings have a very tough second half. They have to play the 49ers. They have to go into Soldier Field. I mean, they have a very tough second half. JT, who are you picking? Washington? I'm gonna pick or Minnesota. Minnesota. I'm gonna pick Minnesota in that game, and I, you know, I'll, I'll go with Washington. <laughs> I, I'm a Minnesota fan, but at the same time, I, I, that's like I said, that's a game they have to win in order to go up to that next level. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Minnesota also at home. They're tough to beat there. We I think we have a phone call. Caller, you're on the air. Yes, how you doing? Just fine. Yeah, I, I want to get back on the subject of the Falcons. I'm from Philadelphia myself, so I'm kind of supporting the Eagles in their quest for the Super Bowl this year. But uh, to get back on the Falcons, I think the major thing with their defense is that they don't hit. I look at Deion Sanders, who hits with his shoulder, and other defensive backs. They're coming in with their shoulder, and the main thing in football is to hit. Now, you take a look at the Philadelphia Eagle defense. I mean, those guys are squaring up. You got Reggie White, Jerome Brown. Uh, well, Jerome Brown's not there. Excuse me. You got Seth Joyner. And, uh, uh, and their de even their defensive backs. And, and if you look at the Eagles' defense, it's their defensive backs that are hitting that is really stopping the run because you got to get past the front line. Then you got to try and get past Seth Jordan and the linebackers. And then, hey, you got Andre Waters and Wes Hopkins back there hitting. So, you know, just to get back on the, uh, the Falcons, I think the main thing is they need to get some hitters and leave the speed alone because this is the NFL and not the, you know, the CFL. Very good point. Well, Very think, good point. I think he missed the biggest hitter there on the Eagles is uh, Andre Waters. Uh, well, well he, he mentioned him. He oh, touched him along with Wes Hopkins. Uh, uh, that's true, and that's just a tribute to uh, the way that they can scout players and, and, and get the type of players that fit into their style of play in their organization. And that's something that I think they obviously do much better than the Falcons do. 
Well, you know, he, he mentioned the Falcons not being that type of team. Well, probably the best hitter on the Falcons is Scott Case. Scott Case has been hurt all year, hasn't played. Um, what he was alluding to is, you know, the, the two main things as far as football is concerned is blocking and tackling. And, you know, Vince Lombardi, I mean, that's what he, you know, prophesied down. And you don't see that there was a special on ESPN or one of the other uh, networks recently about the lack of tackling recently in the NFL. And it's so true. I mean, people just put their shoulder in. They don't wrap up. I mean, you see it in college, too. And, and I, you know, you're talking about the Eagles being able to do it. Well, look at their last two coaches. You're talking about um, Bud Carson, who's their defensive quarter, coordinator right now, and Buddy Ryan, who, I mean, you're talking about two of the best defensive coaches in the NFL hit, you know, recently. And the Eagles definitely know how to tackle, and they do a very good job of it. All right, uh, let's take another call. Caller, you're on the air. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm also a big Eagles fan, and um, I'm just wondering, of course, I was ill after the last game with the Redskins. I think it, it really, I think they're just as good as the Redskins, but I think they just came alive a little bit too late in that game. And I want to know what you think their chances are to get to the Super Bowl because I, I really think this is the Eagles' year to do it. And also, I'd like to get your opinion on what you think the Falcons need to do to step up another level because it just seems like they're off a of beat. I mean, they have the, the makings of a, of a good team, and, and all their games except for the last one have been pretty close against some good teams. So I'm just wondering, you know, what your opinions are. All right. I'd like okay. to thank you for your call. I'll keep watching. Okay, let's quickly hit on that. Uh, well, like we said before, uh, Philadelphia can go a long way because their defense can take them a long way, and they have the big play potential of what their quarterback can have a ball control off 